This is the Panasonic Lumix S5, and it's a strange camera that kind of makes you rethink Panasonic's entire lineup. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and my name's Jeff. So let's start off with some disclosure here. Panasonic sent me this camera and kit lens combo to review, and I've had it for just over a month. After I agreed to review it, I was informed that I could keep the samples if I wanted. Generally, I prefer to do loners for cameras because I like that separation, but I deal with free samples of other gear all the time, and it doesn't affect my objectivity because just because something is free doesn't make it good, and I don't want my place filled with useless free stuff any more than you do. So I'll be evaluating this camera at its retail price, like any review should be conducted, but I wanted you to be fully aware of the conditions under which I received this camera. But we'll talk more about value and my recommendations at the end of the video, as usual. And with all of my reviews, Panasonic does not get to see this video before posting. Also, my approach to this video was to evaluate both the photo and video capabilities of this camera, but with an emphasis on using this kit lens that came with it to see how it would work as a combo and to provide a small review of the lens while I'm at it, since I think this combination is a big part of the targeting for this new camera. Because this new camera is definitely smaller and lighter than Panasonic's previous offerings. Together, this combo weighs just over one kilogram at around 2.33 pounds and only 715 grams for the body only. This is a big improvement compared to the S1, which weighed over a kilo without a lens. And to try and make some kind of vlogging combo on the S1 by adding, say, the 16 to 35, you'd be closer to 1.5 kilos. So this is noticeably lighter when held out with your arm extended. It's actually even a little bit smaller and lighter than the GH5, but it's still a little bigger and heavier than the A7S III. The body design is somewhere in between the GH5 and an S1. It doesn't have a top screen or XQD card slot and has a fully articulating screen instead of the multi-tilt version on the S1, but the overall aesthetic is very similar to the S1, just sort of a more compact version. And this in-between is mostly positive, but there are a couple of new annoyances. First off, I don't like this new AF on button. It's small, bubbly, and slippery, and I find it difficult to fully depress with a flat thumb. With big fingers like mine, you need to get up on the tip of your finger to press it all the way in. The new forward command dial is a little weird at first too, but I got used to it pretty quickly. The rest of the controls feel pretty familiar and comfortable, and I generally always liked the ergonomics of Panasonic, but there are some compromises that were made to make this body smaller that I'm not too fond of. One, they're now using a micro HDMI port, which I really dislike. And when you're using it, the angles your screen can take are very limited. I actually prefer the S1's basic tilting screen here because at least I can get it to angle upwards while using HDMI. With this camera, you can't because you can't rotate the screen forward with the HDMI connected. And when using the new screen as front facing, which is how it beats the S1, I like that they have the microphone jack above and out of the way of the screen, but they didn't think to separate the flaps for the mic and headphones. So sometimes this giant audio jack flap can block some of the screen. I also don't like that only one SD card slot is UHS-2. To be fair, nothing on this camera actually requires UHS-2 because it doesn't have the all intro recording options of the GH5 or the S1H, but I prefer to have both slots be the same. Luckily, this doesn't prevent you from using the backup recording options because again, UHS-1 is all you need for that. Now it gets a bit stranger when we look at the battery. This camera is using a new battery type, which is also sort of a hybrid between the S series and the G series with some backward compatibility. Judging by the pinouts on this new battery, it has the old style connector from the BLF19 that you'd find on the GH5 and G9, but also this new set of pins for the S5. So you might be able to use these batteries in your old G cameras, but I don't think your old G cameras will work in this camera because they don't have the new pins and neither are compatible with the S1 or S1H. This is pretty peculiar if you ask me, but thankfully the battery life was pretty good. Recording 4K video, I was getting about two hours and 15 minutes on a full charge on average. For photos, it depends how you use your camera and your EVF settings, but you can get anywhere from 500 to 1500 photos, depending on how conservative you are. For me, with casual shooting, one battery lasts me all day with performance somewhere between the G9 and the S1. But the camera also has a USB-C port that can charge the battery and keep the battery juiced up while recording for seemingly indefinite runtime. I recorded for three hours with the camera connected to a USB power bank, and it was still at full power when I was done. So that's great. It was also during these battery rundown tests that I determined that overheating was not gonna be a problem for me, at least not in my environment, which ranged from 22 degrees Celsius indoors to 28 degrees outdoors, which is 72 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit respectively. There's no record limit in the 8-bit modes except for in 4K60, but there is a 30-minute limit in the 10-bit modes, and I'm told this is due to heat, but I'm also told that this is a very conservative limit based on recording in a 43 degrees Celsius or 110 degree Fahrenheit environment. But in my testing, there was nothing stopping me from just pressing record over and over after the 30 minutes was up, and it didn't overheat even after three hours of doing this. 
And I recorded continuously for three hours externally to an Atomos Ninja 5 until my SSD filled up and again, no issues and no warnings. And recording externally bypasses the 30 minute limit so you don't have to restart the recording. And I checked it with the on-screen display on and off to see if there was a quality difference or an overheating change and there wasn't, which is something I've been liking about these new Panasonics is how they give you a 4K on-screen display without affecting the quality of your image. Weather sealing is also a bit different on this body. It has the same dust and splash resistance as the S1, but it doesn't have the freeze resistance rating. So keep that in mind if you tend to shoot in environments of minus 10 or below. But overall, I really like the body. It feels good in the hands. There's still plenty of grip, even though it's smaller, and it still has the excellent controls and menu navigation we've seen from Panasonic in the past, including a full touchscreen display. The display and viewfinder are both lower resolution than you find on the S1, but I found it didn't really bother me too much. This display feels very similar to the GH5, but with a slightly higher resolution. The viewfinder is the biggest weakness though, with only 2.36 million dots versus the 3.68 million on the GH5 and the 5.76 million on the S1. Also, the stabilization is a bit weaker. Now there's two things at play here. One, this lens isn't stabilized, so we're not getting dual IS with this combo, which is noticeable. Body only stabilization just doesn't look as good. And also, I think that the IBIS on this camera is not as good as the S1 or S1H. Without stabilization, I could hold this lens steady at 60 millimeters up to about 1 50th of a second shutter. With stabilization, I could get it down to about 1 6th of a second. So it's a solid improvement, but nothing extreme when it comes to what we've seen from Panasonic before. And when hand holding for video, I found the footage more jittery than what I get with the S1 or S1H, especially when paired with their stabilized lenses. On those cameras, I could get steady shots at 105 millimeters with dual IS that looked better than 50 millimeters with this new combo. But I also took the camera out and did a vlog test with it to see how the stabilization worked in that scenario as well, and with the lens set to 20 millimeters. And here's that clip. Okay, so we're doing a bit of a vlog test here, and we've got a whole bunch of things to test. So first off, audio-wise, I'm actually using a new mic. This is the Deity V-Mic D4 Duo, the one with the two mics. And this is going to test, obviously, the sound of this mic for vlogging. Also, the Dead Cats on it, because it's quite a windy day right now, so we'll see how they do. But also the audio in the camera, because... The Panasonic cameras often have this issue where they can only go to minus 12 dB and that's not enough sometimes for mics that you can't adjust the gain on. Sometimes they're just too hot and you can't turn the preamps down anymore. So we'll see how that works. If I'm clipping at all or anything, well, there's nothing I can do. I, I can't turn it down anymore. The other thing that we're going to check is the auto function. So right now I have it on auto ISO. I have a variable ND on so that it has full range to play. The widest this lens goes at 20 millimeters is f3.5 and we're shooting at 1 50th of a second and we're in 4k 10 bit 422 24p. The sun is coming in and out so we'll see how it does for that. I also have it on auto white balance to see just how it adjusts and if it meters correctly we should be able to just put the vlog LUT on and be done but we'll see. The sky is still kept in the shot and I look reasonably well exposed. I had to turn the screen up to plus three brightness. It was on auto and it wasn't cutting it in this bright sun sun just came out again so we'll see how it does on my face uh, but at plus three i can see myself well we're also going to be testing the autofocus because i have the autofocus turned on and it's doing a face detection box right now which i mean it's tracking me but i don't know if the autofocus is keeping up because often these panasonic cameras the detection works fine but the focus doesn't always look good it's just unreliable but we'll see we'll see how it works uh, also the stabilization. I've got the stabilization turned on. Now there is no lens stabilization, so we're not using dual IS. This is just body only. And I found that it's okay, but it's not quite as good as the dual IS, and it's not quite as good as like the S1 or the S1H or the GH5. A little bit worse than that, but you know, judge for yourself how it looks. I'm not trying particularly hard to be smooth. I'm just walking. All right, so I'm just going to walk through some light areas and some dark areas with changing exposure and white balance, and we'll listen to the audio while I tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you could really use some footage, but shooting it yourself was either budgetarily or logistically unfeasible? Well, Storyblocks has you covered with an impressive collection of stock footage, covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K video. They're also amply supplied with backgrounds, overlays, and After Effects templates, and the interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty-free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. Another thing to evaluate is going to be the background separation because with this lens at 20 millimeter, and my voice is echoing weirdly here, anyway, it, it, the widest it goes is f3.5, so I'm right up against this brick wall now. I'll just walk a few feet away from it so we can see how much sort of separation you're getting there. Now obviously if we were at like 60 mil, it's going to be a lot better, but the 60 mil is an f5.6, this is as wide as it goes, and obviously <laughs> this is too tight for vlogging. So. Even if you tried something maybe like 30 mil, 
You have to have long arms to hold it this far away, and I still feel like you're not getting a ton of separation. This is at f4.1 now. After watching that footage, I thought it was mostly fine. As predicted, the audio was a problem occasionally, and I don't think the wind protection on that mic is the greatest, but the sound was pretty good otherwise. The autofocus did well enough for a low stakes vlog, but I did see it get soft on my face from time to time, and I also noticed the stabilization caused some of that warping wobbly stuff in the corners at times. The metering was decent, not the best I've seen, but usable. It did overexpose me occasionally. Something I like about this camera though is that it lets you set the zebras to a zero stop setting, which basically tells you what your target middle gray is without needing to look it up. The only disadvantage of this type of zebra setting is that it locks you out of turning on both sets of zebras at the same time. But it's nice that the S5 has inherited that option from the S1H to be able to activate two sets of zebras simultaneously if using the percentage based setting. And there's even a new function called the luminance spot meter that you can use to point at objects and it'll tell you if they're middle gray or how many stops over or under they are. This is pretty sweet, since I find the waveforms on this camera to be pretty hard to read. But that should be mentioned as a positive, that waveforms are included in this camera, as well as the rest of the paid vlog upgrade for the S1. Something that costs $200 on the S1 is free and built in this camera, including proper vlog with vGamut, MOV files with linear PCM audio, 10-bit video, and proper HLG. And apparently before the end of the year, they're going to be adding raw output over HDMI, similar to what they did with the S1H, DCI 4K resolution support, vector scope, shutter angle, and master pedestal control. So it'll pretty much be a full frame GH5 by the end of the year because it also includes the specialty functions like live cropping that the GH5 had, but the S1 didn't. And when it comes to that full frame sensor, it's identical to the S1, which means we're getting that same excellent dynamic range. I busted out the Xyla 21 again to test this camera. Thanks again to DSC Labs for providing that wonderful chart. And I was getting a solid 12.5 stops of usable dynamic range in V-Log with a signal to noise ratio of two. So before the A7S 3 came out, that was the best you could get in a mirrorless camera. Now it's second best, but still very, very good. Also, if you're curious about non-log, I measured 11.3 stops in HLG and 11.8 stops in the new new Cine-like D version 2. And because it's the same sensor, we're getting the same rolling shutter performance, which is quite decent for a full frame camera. There is some jello at 4K24 full frame, but it's tolerable. And it's almost non-existent in 4K60 because of that APS-C crop in that mode. And lastly, because it's the same sensor as the S1, that means there's no optical low pass or AA filter in this camera, like the one you'd find in the S1H. However, it does share some similarities to the S1H that I was surprised to see, considering that this is a cheaper camera than the S1. So I expected it to be an S1, but worse, not be a discount S1, with S1H features. First off, it doesn't have the issue that the S1 had where the focus peaking gets dimmer when you start recording. It's fixed here, just like it is on the S1H. It also has anamorphic support with stabilization, just like the S1H, and it even has some time code features. I definitely wasn't expecting that considering the marketing materials I received with the camera listed as a camera for high level amateurs. Amateurs that use anamorphic lenses and need time code apparently. <laughs> what a strange little camera. Jumping back to the dynamic range and the image quality though, it's quite good. I did notice the blues come in a bit hotter than the reds, but the roll off is nice and it's easy to work with. Noise is well controlled and the image isn't overly digital looking. Dennis sent over the latest 55 media LUTs for vlog and I like the way they're looking on these shots. If you aim for a 42% middle gray exposure, you get a pretty easy workflow with just a LUT and minor tweaking. And just like the S1, this sensor uses dual native ISOs of 640 and 4000 when in vlog with only minor losses in dynamic range by switching. Cycling through the ISO range, I'm pretty happy with the noise performance, even with the noise reduction in the camera set to the lowest setting. The images are impressively clean, up to 12,800, and don't completely fall apart until 50,000, with 25,600 being easily usable in a pinch. If we take a look at some raw photos, we can see that there's plenty of flexibility to push and pull these images, and they hold up well under stress. Oh, by the way, I often get asked how I edit raw images before Lightroom is compatible with new cameras. I use a program called EXIF tool, and I change the metadata of the image to reflect an earlier camera using the same sensor. So in this case, I just changed all these images so that Lightroom would think that they were from the S1, and then they open fine. And speaking of raw photos, one feature that's been significantly improved on this camera over the other S cameras is the high resolution mode. You know that mode where you create a 96 megapixel image from four slightly shifted captures of 24 megapixels? Well, you can do that in raw now on this camera instead of just JPEG. And that's pretty incredible if you think about it. And while we're talking about image quality, we should probably discuss this lens a bit too. This is a 20 millimeter to 60 millimeter lens with a variable aperture of f3.5 to 5.6. Generally speaking, I don't like lenses this slow with this variable of an aperture, unless they're big telephotos, but it does only increase the price of this kit by $300, 
so I can let some of that slide. This focal range is quite useful. 20 millimeters is nice for vlogging purposes or architectural work, and it covers the other popular 35 and 50 millimeter looks too. It's well balanced on the S5 and performed better than I expected. F3.5 is not fast enough at 20 millimeters for my taste, but I was impressed by its control of chromatic aberration. Throughout the focal range, fringing was mostly non-existent. Flare is also reasonably well controlled for a lens like this. You do get some noticeable overall contrast reduction, but there's minimal ghosting and color shifts. The camera has a built-in vignette reduction option, which certainly does make a difference when shooting wide. It wasn't too terrible to begin with, but it does help. But be mindful if using that setting with filters on the front of your lens as it can overcompensate and cause strange behavior in the corners. And speaking of filters, the front diameter is 67 millimeters on this lens. With Panasonic, the corrections are applied in camera and not controllable in Lightroom, so I can't show you distortion before and after comparisons, but the corrected images are again quite good for distortion compensation as well. 20 millimeters is where it gets it the worst, but it cleans up quickly as you zoom. One area where this lens shows some weakness though is in corner sharpness, especially at 20 millimeters. The corners get quite soft, almost blurry when at 20 millimeter f3.5. This improves by zooming in, which of course also stops down the lens to f5.6. For video, I hate this. I don't like having my exposure change while zooming, and so for video I'd probably only really use this lens for vlogging and with auto ISO enabled. However, when it comes to manually focusing, it's quite good for video. The focus ring is well dampened, and the camera allows you to set the lens to a linear response mode and control the degree of focus throw, which is pretty fantastic, basically allowing you to customize a manual focus experience that works best for you. Focus breathing is very well controlled as well, no complaints there. And I also found the lens to be almost perfectly parfocal. There might be a little bit of shifting, but focus was very well maintained when changing focal lengths, so some nice surprises and utility here. The out of focus areas are satisfactory for the most part. It's not gonna win any bokeh awards, it's fine. However, at 20 millimeters, you do start to see some cutting into the corners, which hurts the shape of the out of focus highlights. This issue is resolved by 22 millimeters though. This lens also has a rather lackluster minimum focusing distance. You'll get a slightly better reproduction ratio at 20 millimeters, but neither end of the focal range creates very inspiring close-ups. Overall, the lens is fine. It's sharp enough in the center to get the job done, and most of its issues are only bothersome at 20 millimeters and resolved by 24. The corners kind of suck, and you shouldn't expect to be blown away by its resolving power or bokeh, but as a kit lens, it's acceptable, and I like the focal range. I just wish it was a bit faster. Before we move on to autofocus, let's talk audio for a second. As I already mentioned in the vlog test, I wish this camera inherited the S1H's audio controls. It feels like a step backward to be limited in gain control again, forcing you to use an attenuation cable for certain mics. It has a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a 3.5 millimeter powered mic jack. And I like that it keeps the option to choose between mic level and line level. And the preamps do seem a bit cleaner than the S1. Still not quite as good as the S1H to my ears, but less noise than I measured from the S1. And I'm told this camera is compatible with the current XLR adapter that the previous cameras use as well. Also, I briefly tested the slow motion modes on this camera. The high speed video has been completely revamped. Rather than enter it from the menu, now it's been added to the command dial and it's been renamed to S and Q, like what Sony uses. Once you move the dial over, then you can go into the menu and set your frame rates. It doesn't have the issue the S1 did at launch where you couldn't adjust your exposure settings when in that mode. This is now a fully functional mode with autofocus. No audio though, because it's an in-camera slow motion. This camera allows you to set your region to NTSC or PAL, which is great. Because of that new NTSC PAL switch, there's no longer a 24 hertz mode, and thus this camera does not record true cinema 24p. It only does 23.976 NTSC. The other thing about the S and Q mode I don't like is that it also forces you into this low bitrate MP4 mode, which drops the bitrate from 100 megabits per second down to 24 megabits per second without changing the H.265. So it's just a worse image. This could be improved a few ways, either by allowing the 100 megabit per second MOV files in S and Q, or by using the HEVC codec built into the camera. Perhaps there's a processor or thermal limitation on that mode though, and unlike the S1H, there's also no 10-bit options in S and Q. And this reduction in quality isn't just a 1080p thing either, because the regular 1080p looks great. But as soon as you switch to SNQ, that 1080p image just falls apart with more noise, artifacts, and color issues, and it gets worse as you increase frame rate. At 120 frames per second, it looks a bit worse, but you still keep AF and there's no crop. At 150 frames per second, it looks terrible and you lose autofocus. And then at 180 frames per second, it crops in on that worse image, magnifying the issues, and again, with no autofocus. But losing autofocus isn't that big of a deal as we'll discuss in a minute because it's not very reliable in this mode anyway. 
As I mentioned earlier though, the regular modes look great. 4K24 and 4K30 are full frame, full feature with 10 bit 422. The only limitations are in 4K60, which drop you to 420 subsampling in 10 bit internally and add that 1.5 times crop. You can keep the 10 bit 422 if you record externally though, which like I said earlier, will also bypass that 30 minute limit in the 10 bit modes. But if you need to record internally without time limits, you'll either need to record in 1080p and 10 bit or be stuck at 8 bit and 4K. Okay. Now let's talk about that autofocus. When I was asked to review this camera, I was promised that the autofocus had been significantly improved. And if you've seen any of my previous Panasonic S series videos, I frequently suggested that they were just one good autofocus system away from being essentially perfect cameras. That was before Sony came along and basically made that camera with the a7S III, albeit a more expensive and more video focused version. But anyway, there's already tons of autofocus information out on the S1 and S1H and the G series cameras before them. So that all we really need to know is did the autofocus improve? Not in any meaningful way. Often when Panasonic talks about improving their autofocus, they talk about how the detection methods have improved. Now we can detect bodies and heads and disembodied heads and animals and people dress as animals and so on. But what I don't find ever gets better is the predictability of the system. Max Zuriev did a series of tests that I saw in advance of this video that shows that the S5 can keep up with and beat the Sony a7 III for video autofocus in certain scenarios, most notably when switching to the APS-C crop 4K60 mode. And I will admit that the 4K60 mode does drastically outperform the 4K24 mode. But the problem is I never know what's going to trigger Panasonic to just completely lose focus and seemingly refuse to come back. Sometimes it's just turning your head the wrong way, which makes the whole head detection thing kind of pointless. Plus, even when it is tracking correctly, it still pulses. And if you look closely, you'll see a face or a product get slightly softer and sharper repeatedly through a shoot. Autofocus for video needs to be two things, predictable and reliable. If it doesn't score a nine out of 10 in each of those categories, it might as well score a zero. And so while the autofocus may be improved in this camera, it's still not reliable or predictable enough to recommend for video. It is a lot more usable for photography though, as long as you can tolerate a couple of quirks. For all but the fastest moving subjects, this camera will autofocus reliably for photos and give consistent results. It does struggle if you're trying to focus on lights in a dark environment or in very low contrast scenes, but you'll be fine shooting anything else. When it comes to action, I find I can still manage to get four to five usable frames in focus every second, even with fast moving subjects. That's not gonna keep up with Sony, but it's pretty decent for a contrast only system. But like I said, there are some quirks. First, when doing continuous autofocus, the reticle stays green the entire time you hold the button, even when the subject isn't in focus. This is weird and counterintuitive. On the Sony, for example, the box is gray until the subject is in focus, and then it turns green, letting you know that you're good. Not having this confirmation on the Panasonic makes it difficult to know if you've actually acquired focus or not, which is worsened by quirk number two, which is that this camera temporarily changes your exposure to acquire focus. So what you see in the viewfinder is a flickering exposure with a misleading focus box that's always green. Not only does this bother my eye after a while, but I'm basically just spraying and praying that my shots will be in focus. And then you review them and see that surprisingly, most of them are, but it just doesn't instill confidence and can be disorienting if coming from Canon or Sony. So as I've said in probably 10 other videos at this point, usable for photos, not so much for video, unless it's really low stakes and reliability isn't that important. And I realize that Panasonic is probably too deep into this DFD system now to change, but each time they have a new camera with new autofocus for me to test, the result is always the same. I wish they would just accept this and look at what Canon and Sony have put out for autofocus this year and finally develop a new, different autofocus system. All right, let's wrap up and talk value because this is where this strange camera gets even stranger. It's $500 less than the S1. Usually we see companies distinguish their cameras strongly enough into their marketing segments by changing or limiting functions so they minimize the risk of cannibalizing sales or rendering current offerings obsolete. I'm not so sure Panasonic did that this time around. If we look at the S1, it does have some advantages over the S5. It doesn't have recording limits, the battery life is a little bit better, it has better displays, and it's a bit more ruggedly built. But those improvements are marginal, and when I compared the S1 to the S1H, I said that if you added the V-Log upgrade and the Ninja 5 to the S1, you could get pretty close to the capabilities of the S1H, save for the raw output, and for less money. Well now the S5 comes along, still needing the Ninja 5 like the S1 for max potential, but it's getting the raw update, has the V-Log upgrade already included, is getting all those other upgrades like shutter angle, DCI 4K for free, and is now $700 cheaper than the S1 if you factor in the price of the V-Log upgrade. 
It has basically rendered the S1 obsolete because the S1's advantages aren't worth $700 in my opinion. And because the S5 is more compact, it should now satisfy the people that complain that the S1 was too big and heavy for travel and vlogging. Well now you even get a vlogging lens kit option for less than it would cost to add that to your existing S1. But the reason why I called this camera strange so many times is because it also seems weird to suggest this as a cheap vlogging or travel camera, because it's still $2,000 and clearly loaded with features suitable for professional purposes. Which is why I can totally see the existence of this camera causing frustration in current S1 owners. But I think we should actually be happy that there's a company out there willing to eat up part of its own market share in the name of improving their products with this new cheaper and in many ways better body. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Alright. I'm done.